Welcome to the weekly S&P 500 chart storm run through. This is for the Sunday, the 2nd of February, New Zealand time, because I'm in New Zealand. Um, so if you don't know what the chart storm is, um, well, it's basically 10 charts that I pick out each week from across Twitter and that are, um, you know, showing up on my own radar. And um, the point is really just to bring a collection of charts together. Um, sometimes it is to sort of bring together a, a full picture and sort of one particular angle, but you know, I try to um, take quite a balanced view of this and, and also um, bring a little bit of longer term perspective with a couple of sort of interesting charts as well. Um, so we'll just get straight into it. And I'm th what I'm going to do is go through each of the charts and um, add a little bit of extra comments beyond the, you know, whatever it is these days, 140, 280 characters. Um, so we'll start with the first one, Happy New Month. So we'll just bring the chart up into the full view. So we've got here the monthly S&P 500 chart there, um, and the black line 10 month moving average, which basically equates to about 200 day moving average. Um, not really too much to add there. Uh, it's a new month, um, January, it was down minus 0.16% month over month. Um, I did note on the subsequent one there, it is worth noting that the S&P 500 is currently, and you know, we'll see where that goes, currently minus 3.7% from the the highest high to the lowest low um, over the last few days. Um, and actually that brings us to the next one, you know, um, this shows you in the black lines there, um, DBC, which is a commodities ETF, TNX, which is basically 10 year yield, and Asia, which is a China Asia ETF. You can see there, um, basically pointing to more downside risk. Um, well, so, well, you know, I guess there's two interpretations for this one. One is that they're, they're pointing to more downside risk. The other one is that they are, um, have reached full panic mode. Um, I think the truth is probably somewhere in between. Um, and you know, why did I pick those three different things here? Well, first of all, commodities, um, they've been beaten up fairly badly and bloodied around by this, uh, virus outbreak. Um, same thing with China Asia's and, and again with, um, 10 year treasuries, you know, just that flight to safety, um, sort of this uh, concern that the virus outbreak will lead to, you know, the travel disruption, the supply chain disruption, and that will um, throw off the nascent economic recovery that we had sort of started to see signs of. Um, as I mentioned in the video from yesterday, I'm going to do blog posts this week on the global growth outlook. So, um, you know, I'll kind of hold my um, tongue a little bit in term, in, until um, you know, I get that together. But, um, you know, we're basically at, I think, a turning point in growth to the upside. We've been through a recession in the global economy. Um, but, you know, this virus has sort of brought back the um, concerns about that. And, you know, those concerns were at their peak back in September there and see where the 10 years was at similar levels. Um, and I guess quite closely related here, number three chart is the 50 day moving average breadth indicator rolled over from very much overbought levels, pretty much the same level as, you know, some of those previous market peaks. Um, and then, you know, it's not quite at the oversold washout levels that, you know, we saw in some of the previous market bottoms. So, you know, I always like to, I mean, my, my bias is to, especially when I've got this core cool bullish view in the background is to, um, you know, fade this kind of fear and panic, um, cause it always tends to get overblown, you know, the news or the noise tends to, um, create this, um, very knee jerk reaction which often creates opportunities. But I think that, you know, there probably is still a little bit of water to go under the bridge here. And, um, as I, 
explained in the last couple of chart storms, especially last week, uh, there was actually a bit of signs of froth, a bit of overbought signals, sentiment, stretch, valuations, and all the rest of it. And so, you know, um, in terms of the timing of the bad news, it's probably about as bad as it gets. So basically the market was kind of ready to roll over to, well, not roll over as such, but to have a um, bit of a sell off or correction. So, you know, it's um, it's kind of just to be expected in, in that sense. So really looking for these kind of indicators to get all the way to the downside, real washed out and oversold um, to, you know, start looking at taking position against that panic. Number four, this chart or series of charts here shows kind of an analog of how markets behaved during the SARS breakout in 2002, I'm kind of comparing that to the current coronavirus outbreak. Um, as I mentioned in the subsequent chart, so well, I guess the, the first of all, the takeaway from this is that you know you can see there that it didn't really have that bigger impact. And that's kind of the general rule of thumb with this kind of thing. You know, whether it's um, a disease outbreak or a geopolitical event, the impact on markets tends to be quite short-lived, uh, mostly having a sentiment impact. But I guess the, the, the cautionary to that that I would provide would be that if you look at this chart here, it's called, I call it the euphoria meter, which is a combination of the Ford P ratio, bullish sentiment in surveys, so that's the AAII and the II surveys, and the smooth level of the fix, inverted. Um, and the, the reason why I've chosen those components is that they give you um, three different kinds of sentiment measures and so it gives you this kind of compliment, uh, composite sentiment measure here and the as you know, as I was saying back in 2002 the euphoria meter was you know very looking very bleak at that time very bearish um, whereas now it's in basically in euphoria mode uh, you know yes it can go higher well, yes, it has been higher, but basically, um, yeah, at 2002, the market was kind of ready and wanting to bottom. And now the, um, you know, it's almost, you could, you could almost argue that the market is close to doffing and wanting to top. So, you know, again, back to what I was saying about, um, you know, some of these sentiment measures getting a little bit stretched, some of the valuation, technicals kind of looking ready for a, a sell-off um, and, and I keep on using these terms sell-off correction just to clarify sell-off I think is you know a smaller version so something around five percent correction I would call that sort of you know more ten to fifteen percent and I keep on using them interchangeably because you know um, the difference between a sell-off and a correction can be, um, you know, in terms of what precedes it, can be very, very little. You know, once um, panic and fear get a bit of momentum of their own, um, it can go further than you think. But basically there, um, what I'm saying is that, you know, it may not be even though I'm, I'm kind of relaxed or I want to go against the um, virus panic, it may not be um, wise to compare SARS versus coronavirus because those, um, you know, 2002 versus 2020, two very different market setups. So number six here, we've got macro sentiment, um, which basically I'm proxying based on the futures positioning. So this is the COT, um, COT commitment of traders report from the CFTC. Got crude oil, copper, equity indexes aggregated, and the inverse of treasuries and DXY positioning. 
basically designed to give you sort of a view of macro sentiment. It had got, you know, rebounded right back up there and then now obviously it's in the process of rolling over as you'd expect given the price action we've seen in treasuries and commodities. Um, yeah, again, it's that whole thing of maybe there is a bit more water to go under the bridge. When these things roll over, they take a bit of time to get all the way back down. And, um, you know, again, that the washing out of um, positioning there could take actually quite a few, well, a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I was looking at crude oil positioning before that hasn't really come off that much at all. Copper has gone from a small positive to a small negative. Um, you know, certainly, no, um, you know, the price action would say capitulation, but so far the positioning is not really saying um, capitulation. So, you know, again, something to be mindful of. Number seven, this is quite an interesting one in the green line there. So this is actually a departure in a way from some of the previous sort of themes I've been talking about. Um, the green line is the economic surprise index but only for um, leading indicators and surveys. And so, you know, if you see this turning up, basically the leading indicators are starting to look better than expected. And you have seen there um, a turn up in that indicator versus, you know, the industrial sector in the gray line. So industrials versus the S&P 500 have just been smashed, um, very much panic mode in terms of pricing performance there. And I, I quite like these kind of charts, I've got quite a few of myself, um, but you know, we, um, th there can be a lot of information in these coincident relationships um, where there's like a disconnect. Wherever you see those gaps open up, they can present quite interesting opportunities. So for example, back in 2011 there, when that green line actually collapsed to the downside in that situation, it collapsed before the industrials did. And um, we're, we'll look for an example in the opposite direction. So 2012 there, you saw the green line turning up um, and industrials got left behind, but then they finally did catch back up. So that's quite an interesting one to keep an eye on. And it's, um, you know, I guess it's kind of like a good news version or, um, or it just goes to show really um, again, kind of what I was referring to back with the macro picture. Uh, my core view is global growth rebounds in 2020, and I haven't changed that view. Um, and But meanwhile, markets are kind of in panic mode. So definitely a situation or a theme to, to keep in mind. Number eight, so this one is, I guess, on the negative side. The, the yellow line there is the proportion of companies with negative EBITDA margins, so profit margins. Um, backwards looking data, so quite laggy data here. Um, so I would note that, but you know, I guess the thing to note there is that we have just been through a global export and manufacturing recession. Um, I think that that probably ends either this quarter or next quarter, um, you know, officially. But, you know, you look at the, the hard data back in November and the stuff that's starting to come out for De December, you know, it's clear that there was basically a manufacturing export recession for the global economy last year. And obviously that's going to weigh on earnings. And, you know, the biggest thing that impacts on profit margins really is the economy. Um, you know, in my experience, you tend to see profit margins get squeezed more by the top line falling than by, you know, costs rising. I think there's that kind of popular view out there that, you know, oh, wage inflation goes up and that squeezes profit margins. But most of the time it's, um, you know, something happens to growth, growth falls, um, most companies have relatively decent operational leverage and therefore, um, you know, you see that actually expressed in profit margins. So, um, yeah, in terms of the implications of that, um, I guess it's just another 
piece of um, data that confirms that you know we have been or perhaps still are in the middle of um, a, a, an economic slowdown and it's quite logical that that would flow through to the earnings. So the last two charts are kind of in the interesting category. As I mentioned at the start, I try to put in you know some sort of charts that are kind of quite interesting, quite thought provoking. Um, maybe they don't have actually that much implications for the outlook, but they're still um, interesting to to be aware of at least. So this one would fall into that category. It's um, who owns the U.S. equity market. And uh, we've got households there, still is the biggest share. And then you've got other things like passive mutual funds and ETFs, active mutual funds. So it's interesting to see the the bit of a passing of the torch there is, um, you know, this whole rethink of active versus passive continues to play out and pressure on um, fees is also a big dynamic there. Um, pension, government retirement funds, foreign investors. Foreign investors have been rising over time. Um, again, there's probably not a huge implication in terms of the outlook from that. Uh, last one, quite an interesting pair of charts there, pie charts, is um, showing the top 1% of households by wealth, um, their asset allocations, so equity is the big one there. Um, and the bottom 50%, you know, obviously real estate's going to be the bigger part because most people, well, a lot of people own their own house and durable, so just things tends to make up a pretty significant chunk of their um, their assets as well. Probably much as you'd expect, I guess. So um, just to wrap up, I guess so we'll go back to the start ones because, you know, in terms of I guess uh, kind of summing those up for the market outlook for the week ahead. You know, uh, I think that there's still, again, a bit of water to go under the bridge. Further out, I remain bullish, but, you know, these, there's been a clear shift in sentiment on the macro front. Um, there is definitely still some fundamental uncertainty about the virus. And some of these sentiment, these um, technical indicators rather, there's a bit of water to go under the bridge there before they get to the, you know, really significantly oversold levels where, um, you know, the odds, the probabilities do start to, to shift. So I'll leave it there. And if you've got any comments, feedback, suggestions, definitely put them in the section below.